I have to confess, I, I, I don't know how dazzling I can be under the circumstances. Just because I, I flew in, and as I've spoken to some of you this morning, I flew in and, and I was, thought I was being very responsible. I flew in a, a day in advance to get acclimated, and of course, jet lag waited until this morning. And so I've been up since about four. So anything I say that's, um, that is incoherent is not at all about my research, <laughs> just my lack of sleep. Um, but it's really a pleasure to be here. It's, it's a pleasure to be back in the Northeast. I grew up here. I, I'm um, originally from Jamaica, which I'll say a little bit more about. But there's something, as wonderful as it is to live in Honolulu, there's something really warm and comforting and familiar about being in the Northeast. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. And I'm really glad to be able to be here and have a discussion about um, some of the issues that I'm working on that may seem quite far away, but are still quite relevant to all of us even here, uh, thousands of miles away from the Pacific. Um, I have the lights down. Oh, do I, should I do that? OK. Is this right here? All right, here we are. In the mood. Um, so what I'm talking about today is climate-induced migration. And um, I w the talk is based on some research I did uh, in response to a very specific question asked. Uh, two years ago, the Republic of the Marshall Islands approached the Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia University um, and asked them for help in dealing with some of the thornier questions that are posed by climate impacts in their region and specifically to their country. And because this was a solutions-oriented type of conference, I had a very clear mandate. He said, we need you to respond to the question of statelessness and the issues that arise when islands um, that have no longer have inhabitable land uh, and their citizens are dispersed in myriad locations ac across the globe. What do we do about that circumstance? How do we respond to that from a legal perspective? And so in this talk, I'm going to provide an overview both of the issue of climate-induced migration, which I know some of you are familiar with, but I want to introduce you um, to that um, and then again look at it from the perspective that I looked at it, particularly in trying to conceive of a, of a reasonable and viable solution for the, the challenge of statehood that's represented in some of the kinds of migration that we'll see. So here's how I'll proceed, and I'm hoping to do this in about just under 30 minutes. But I want to give a brief overview of climate change science and the forecasting and how that impacts what I'll be talking about. And then I want to uh, look at the challenges of climate-induced migration and, and highlight some of the issues that exist in the conversation about migration and climate change. And then, um, then I'll sort of drill in deeper to this question of migration, sovereignty, and statelessness, and, and sort of introduce you to my uh, thought process on how to allow for landless nation states to continue to have international personality. And what I argued in my uh, article called The Nation Exitu was that to respond to the phenomenon of landless nation states, international law must accommodate an entirely new category of international actors. And I called them nations exitu. And what I was envisioning in the XC2 statehood is that you would be able to have, as a country, a continued uh, existence as a sovereign state afforded all the rights and benefits of sovereignty amongst the families of, of nations and nation states in perpetuity. And uh, what I, I knew in thinking through this is that in practice you'd have to be able to govern a region, or rather lack of a, a, lack of a territory, but exercise authority over diffuse, diffuse peoples, right? People that are all over the, the world, but still maintain sort of some sort of governance structure so that you can enjoy the rights and privileges of being a state and the international community. And I also conceive of this uh, of, a, of a new kind of trusteeship system that would allow for that kind of diffuse governance. It's a framework that I use, an analogous structure that I, I add to uh, the discourse on. And I, and I try to do this um, first with a disclaimer, which is that in thinking about trusteeships, we are not or certainly I'm not suggesting that there should be any kind of neocolonial <laughs> relationship or governance infrastructure introduced, but a way of thinking about how to govern a deterritorialized state is what I'm getting at, right? So I do two different but inextricably intertwined things in the paper, and I'll briefly do it in the talk given time. First, I attempt to define and justify the recognition of deterritorialized nation states. And then I briefly explain the trusteeship arrangement and uh, how you would govern the XC2 nation. Um, and again, uh, it's after this brief overview of climate science, which some of you may uh, know better than I do. I've spoke to some of who are doing the environmental sciences. But essentially, we are talking about our impacts um, on the global environment, right? We're altering the chemistry of the atmosphere. 
And uh, the research is happening actually right next door to where I live. We used to be at 287 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere before the Industrial Revolution. But scientists at Mauna Loa Observatory and on the Big Island of Hawaii say that carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere as of this year have touched daily averages of 400 parts per million, right? And that's up 40% more than the uh, Industrial Revolution and the highest for at least the last 650,000 years. And the impacts are quite severe. Uh, and the, the cover of this issue of New Scientist and the entire issue was devoted to the fact that the impacts are um, worse than we thought they were, right? And for non-scientists, Lord Nicholas Stern really summarizes some of the impacts and the gravity of them quite well. The emissions are growing faster than we thought. The absorption capacity of the planet is less than we thought. The probability of high temperatures is likely higher than we thought, and some of the effects are coming faster than we thought. And oftentimes in climate talks, we see the <coughs> evidence, right? And the evidence is usually the breakup of, of glaciers and ice sheets. And we'll see images of glaciers. This is one in Peru in 1980, and then in 2003. Right, and we're seeing, we're s to see the, and take away from that the stark impacts of the heat that we're introducing. And then we have images like this. I actually think this is quite beautiful. Um, but what it's telling us, this is an um, iceberg that's capped from the Greenland ice sheet. And it's a striking photo until you pause and consider the implications. Emissions are soaring and climate impacts around the world are appearing with increasing frequency. And forecasts of sea level rise are inherently uncertain but are postulated to be closer to one meter by 2100 as a conservative number. And that's much more than the initial estimates from the IPCC. Uh, the most recent have gotten closer to that number, but still we're, there's some suggestion that the kind of sea level rise we'll see will be greater than what's currently forecast. And the implications for that melting and warming for the most vulnerable and particularly hot spots like small island states in the Pacific and in the Indian Ocean, that it's considerable. And in fact, it's existential in some cases. So countries like the Maldives, Tuvalu, Kiribati, and the Republic of Marshall, the Marshall Islands risk inundation and perhaps uninhabitability prior to submersion. So looking at the migration question a little bit more closely, I, I want to pause for a second and say that um, one of my colleagues at the University of Colorado, um, Sarah Krakoff, who did as well, uh, used to say that she thought it was illegal to have a, to do a presentation on climate change and not have an image of a polar bear. So <laughs> dutifully, I <laughs> present the cute and cuddly polar bear snuggling with, with its cub, which I usually leave in my presentation. This one may be a little bit more appropriate. Um, the bad news is that ice cap is melting and it's going to be almost impossible to catch seals. The good news is that if we keep moving south, there's tons of fat animals called humans who can't run very fast, right? The notion here, right, this demonstrates in sort of a tongue-in-cheek fashion the role of migration as a legitimate adaptive response, right? You go to where the meat is, um, and uh, this makes sense. And in fact, human, throughout human history, we've adapted um, to a number of different locations, and we've moved uh, quite a bit since our beginning. But of course, the way that we've organized our society in recent history and our geopolitical history makes this movement more complex for humans. Um, and the way that we've animated the climate crisis, the way we talk about it, has also posed some challenges. We employ the charismatic megafauna, the large animal that's trotted out to really sort of underscore the enormity of the tragedy, um, and sometimes the exclusion of the human impacts. So while this is a very poignant image and it's very important for us to remember the impacts here, um, it's also important to understand the creeping tragedy, tragedy that's happening to, um, to the polar bear's human neighbors, right? And here is one of the canaries in the coal mine, both for the climate issue and for migration as evidenced in the United States. Um, Inuit communities generally are suffering uh, impacts of climate change, the availability of food, water, shelter is increasingly, increasingly unpredictable at best and at worst. Permafrost and protective sea ice barriers are collapsing and forcing relocation. And there have been some relocation efforts, at least attempts, to relocate in partnership with the federal government. But because these are unprecedented moves, coupled with general political lethargy on the issue, several communities' relocation attempts have been stalled for up to 10 years. And litigation efforts to gain relocation aid from oil and gas companies have also suffered significant setbacks. I also want to offer Hurricane Katrina as an example. 
And of course, um, there is always the attribution question about whether or not we can link a particular event to climate change, but let's just use this as maybe an example of things to come if it's not directly related. And what we saw during that time is not only the uh, massive storm and the total collapse of public uh, preparedness, but we saw also the, uh, about 1.1 million people in Louisiana permanently or temporarily displaced by the storm, 2 million once you added the numbers from Rita that same year. And the FEMA spokeswoman at that time said, we've never had a situation where an entire American city was evacuated and they weren't able to go home. These re numbers represent that phenomenon. So I, I suggest that we, U.S. included, are approaching a new frontier. And I think Hurricane Sandy situated us squarely in that wild space. We're also seeing the phenomenon of international migration in the United States. Um, here there's an example of, uh, of it sort of coming home to roost. Both Hawaii and mainland U.S. is seeing some climate-driven um, migration from the Pacific Island region, specifically countries with which we have um, a, a new compact, uh, 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 migration agreements through the Compact of Free Association. New Zealand has been seeing this for quite some time, and actually very recently, as in yesterday, um, they, the courts in New Zealand were considering the case of a, of a, a self-proclaimed climate refugee uh, who is seeking uh, refuge in, in New Zealand itself. So there's something here. And when Sir David King said the maps of the world will have to be redrawn, he was speaking as a scientist, he was speaking about melting ice sheets, but of course, as someone who's thinking of the law and policy of it all and the geopolitics of it all, uh, this is a, an incredibly powerful statement, and it's true in our world as well. So, um, there's something there. I present this slide, uh, which is meant to show an estimation of the number of people that will move in, in the millions based on sea level rise by meters. But I, sh I show this purely to convey the upward trend because the numbers are likely totally wrong. Right? And I use this because um, it's, it, it's the heart of some of the difficulty of understanding migration, which is we don't really know how many people we're talking about when it comes down to it. It's impossible to know the actual numbers for, for a few reasons, which I can address in the Q&A. But even the, um, the most commonly cited number is offered by Norman Myers. He's an Oxford ecologist. He says it's about 200 to 250 million by 2050. But he said to get to that number involved heroic extrapolations. So he was essentially admitting that he did a lot of guessing to get to this number. But the guesstimates are really um, quite unwieldy. We have everything from 50 million to 1 billion people, depending on the study you look at. And that's sort of an impossible range to, to plan for or to, to prepare against. But if we take the commonly cited number of 200 to 250 million, for perspective, we can imagine a good chunk of the U.S. population, which is about 300 million now, potentially on, on the move or having moved by 2050. And we can also uh, compare that to the current number of migrants, which the International Organization of Migration has estimated to be about 200 million worldwide. So the numbers issue is difficult, and it's, in, it's really difficult to know. But what we do know is that it's already occurring within countries. There's some examples in the United States, certainly South Asia, more internal migration, and in the Pacific region, Pacific Island nations internally as well as across borders. The other thing that we know is that the circumstances of small island states that risk complete loss of territory is distinct, and distinct enough from the larger experience of climate-induced displacement that it deserves to be carved out and dealt with separately and rapidly. But migration generally has been a political hot potato, but uh, it's critically important, as I hope I'll prove, for, for the law to address the <coughs> phenomenon. Now, to, to kind of give you some context as to how I think about these, this kind of issue, um, Professor David Caron wrote what I thought was an incredibly insightful article 23 years ago uh, called the When Law Makes Climate Change Worse, Rethinking the Law of Baselines in Light of Sea Level Rise. And he was talking about uh, policies related to the, the law of the sea. But the message, the vehicle that he uses, the conceptual vehicle he uses, I think is incredibly helpful. We can think about the law as having relevance to climate change and capacity to do something about climate change in some very clear ways, right? When, when the Sierra Club sues to stop the uh, building of coal-fired power plants, we see that as law acting, right, and, and furtherance of mitigation efforts. When we work to help and design uh, Im and implement state programs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, like our state program in Hawaii, the Global S Warming Solutions Act, lawyers worked on how to make that work and how to have that sync with other um, areas of, of governance in the state. 
But there are many instances where the absence of law or the necessary amendments to law that aren't happening exacerbate poor climate forecasts for individuals and communities. And what Karen is essentially saying is that you can understand these as non-natural legal feedbacks. And he's obviously borrowing from the climate scientists who talk about positive feedback loops in which one natural process that's disrupted by climate change accelerates the impacts of climate change. So he's talking about this as sort of a positive feedback loop, and how he just explains it is as follows. Legal feedbacks will not alter the amount of climate change, but will aggravate the suffering that will accompany such change. The greater the change, the greater the aggravation. I think this is totally right on. I have one footnote, though, which is to say that now that we're 23 years past 1990, in fact, legal feedbacks have altered the amount of climate change. Right? The absence of an aggressive binding agreement, uh, the, the success, the failure of Kyoto, essentially, and the absence of a, of a, of a successor um, agreement has actually increased the amount of climate change, or certainly increased the emissions that we're, ex we're going to experience. But of course, there are other feedbacks that are relevant here. Unresolved questions re regarding migration, definitions and classifications of migrants, uh, lack of clarity regarding this resettlement rights, just in this issue of migration is going to be um, important, and the absence of any legal mechanism is making the situation worse. And that's true, too, when we think about the context of statelessness. Statelessness presents an aggravating legal feedback. So one of the things I mentioned was the absence of a definition. And you, I'm sure, have mostly heard climate, the term climate refugees to describe this phenomenon of climate-induced migration or climate migrant. And um, it's important to remember that a refugee can be defined in different ways depending on your discipline and your perspective. Um, it has a political and sociological relevance if it's describing a political phenomenon or, um, or migration as an empirical reality or, or wanting refuge as, a, as an empirical reality. But legally, what's stipulated in national or international law, um, it, it's not there. There is no such thing as a climate refugee. Right? Uh, the Refugee Convention is really dealing with different kinds of circumstances, and to argue otherwise is a little a, a bit difficult, although there is some argument in that, in that realm. But essentially, you have a couple of important hurdles, which is that refugee status usually involves some sort of state-sponsored persecution based on identity um, and uh, urgency. Right? You have to leave, and there's no choice. And, um, and that's why it's important that the absence of climate refugees as a legal term is, is going to be a significant hurdle. Professor Jane McAdam basically said, legal definitions bind states in ways that descriptive labels cannot. So by simply calling them climate refugees, we are not actually able to uh, respect uh, their rights and, 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 and uh, sort of exercise obligations as, as a result of those rights. So that's going to be uh, a different and difficult type of hurdle that they will have to uh, overcome. So, you must ask, and many of the islanders have asked, how do you make policy underwater? How do you have your rights recognized underwater? This was obviously um, a, an important publicity stunt for the Maldivian government in 2009. Right before the Copenhagen agreements, or meetings rather, they uh, decided to have a cabinet meeting underwater to sign a declaration, or, you know, sort of eagerly requesting that there would be a fair, ambitious, and binding agreement at the Copenhagen meetings. Right? And considering their circumstances, you can understand why they would do that. This is Malay. This is the capital of the Maldives at its highest point is about eight feet. This is an incredibly um, uh, stressed community right now. Uh, it's an atoll nation that's looking at the possibility of losing all of its territory, all of its habitable territory. And so they're certainly going to ask for a legally recognized definition um, of, their, of their status, a clear statement of their rights, uh, a determination of what currently exists to address inter international and internal migration, and key to this talk, what to do about statelessness, right? And usually, statelessness is dealing with um, deprivation of nationality, right? It's not designed to deal with situations where no successor state exists and predecessor states have disappeared. It has disappeared in, this, in the cases of what's forecast for some of these island nations. So other questions come up that are really difficult. Uh, when does the nation cease, cease to be a nation? Can you maintain a government much less an identity if your land can no longer be inhabited? Right? So those are the questions. <laughs>
So um, the relative near-term dissolution of a country's habitable territory due to climate change is what I refer to as endangered, the, to, to as the endangered states problem, right? And some, you may hear drowning states, drowning islands, threatened islands. Um, but the endangered states phenomenon represents novel questions that challenge the very foundation of Westphalian or nation state sovereignty. And the countries at issue in particular are mostly in the Pacific. Um, they are, again, Tuvalu, Kiribati, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and of course in the Indian Ocean, the Maldives, which you can't see here in this image. Someone asked me once I gave this if I had Australia sort of out <laughs> in the middle for a reason. I don't, but obviously it's really important to think about the regional dynamics here. The question then is um, what we do about statehood in this context. Um, we are bound by prior understandings of what a state is, and generally speaking, uh, to be a state, you have to have four key elements, permanent population, defined territory, a functioning government, and the capacity to enter into relations with other states. Recently, I shared this with uh, someone who reminded me that um, given a functioning government as a requirement, perhaps the United States might be excluded, but let's for a, for a second assume that that's not the case. Um, we definitely understand that some things are, are we, uh, we have a sense that some things are indispensable and there's certainly a strong argument that territory is one of those elements of statehood that's indispensable. But deterritorialized statehood as an alternative for endangered states has been offered as a possibility before. Not by many, but it's certainly been offered. And others have contemplated having such a successor entity, in particular Rosemary Rayfuse, who is actually a professor of, of law in, in Australia. Um, and there is actually a, a very strong scholarship that's, uh, amount of scholarship that's coming out of that region for obvious reasons on this question. But she in briefly introduced the possibility and argued that ultimately a more equitable solution may lie in recognition of a new category of deterritorialized state. Right? That this is maybe the equitable approach. Um, and that was an important introduction, but scholars generally have not elaborated on what that would mean, nor have they provided justification for the kind of new category of international personality that she's recommending um, and that I agree is a possibility. So that's what I'm doing in the nation ex situ. And the first piece, again, I said was to sort of figure out what it is, what a state is, and then justify why we could, we could maybe, in these cases, uh, relax the territory requirement. They make three basic arguments to support the creation of this new category. The first is that the alternative forms of, of the state are not necessarily novel. There are historical analogs, or I should say, when I say state, I also mean sort of an international entity that sometimes acts and looks like a, 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 a state. Um, there are historical analogs, they're rough, but I think they're relevant, and I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, then I also argue that elements of cosmopolitan theory, as well as the evolving conditions of various diaspora, prove that a landless or virtual nation is appropriate here and is at the same time an inevitable evolution of contemporary citizenship and statehood. And I say this, and I want to be careful not to be too carefree. I, I'm from Jamaica originally, I was born in Kingston, and there's a difference between my experience of diaspora uh, than someone whose state has disappeared. I could go back to Kingston if I chose to. Right? Um, so I don't want to, to draw the, the uh, I don't want to make it too close of an analogy, but I do think there's a blueprint here that's really important to consider, and I'll say more about that as well. But if those two aren't persuasive, I argue that the extraordinary circumstances of threatened nations alone justify such unique departures from the norm. So first, looking at this alternative forms of state, um, there are a few instances where um, international actors kind of provide helpful precedent for the deterritorialized nation idea. They, um, the first is countries that have already governed without a territory, or, uh, failed states and governments in exile, and economic entities that serve quasi-governmental roles like the, the EU. And I'll say um, a little bit more about the first two here. The first um, is this notion of countries that have governed, or international actors that govern like and act like countries um, that have no territory. You might have heard of the Sovereign Order of Malta. Anyone? <laughs> yeah, all right, excellent. Have you been? Right, well, in fact, you can't go to the Sovereign Order of Malta, right? Because the Sovereign Order lost um, access to the island of Malta almost two years ago, 200 years ago, rather, and, um, and had to forge a different kind of relationship with the international community. It's still a sovereign subject, 
of international law. It has its own government. It's based in Rome and essentially an office and virtually on the web. Um, and it has an independent magistrate. It has bilateral diplomatic relations with 104 countries. It's granted the status of permanent observer in a number of uh, international organizations, including the United Nations. And um, it has a pretty interesting and robust uh, uh, way of becoming more familiar with the country, as in its FAQ page, right? Frequently asked questions. This is the um, extent of the Sovereign Order of Malta. And it's been used, I, th I think, as a, a very interesting and important way of considering how one can still be an important international actor, yet have lost territory um, years and years ago. The other example that I want to offer is, uh, the, uh, is Tibet, right? Governments in exile. Um, in 2011, there was an election for the new Tibetan president. 55,000 uh, Tibetans were scattered around the world and participated in this election. And I offer this example um, to show that we can glean important governance lessons from highly, how other highly disparate communities are organized and governed. Right? So the mechanics of coordinating physically disconnected civic participation is demonstrated through uh, the relationship that Tibetans have with their government. Uh, again, even though they are uh, a dispersed people. If you consider the um, cosmopolitan theory and the experience of diaspora, they serve as a counterweight to neat understandings of statehood, land, and citizenship, and the notion that they are inextricably interlinked. What's important to remember, it seems to me, is that climate change acts on this world, right? Even though we've organized ourselves into this world. And so um, borders are superimposed, and they are in some respects, if you will, non-natural legal feedback mechanisms, right? Um, thankfully, though, unlike the laws of physics, they are not immutable or static. They are laws of society and humanity, um, and should be more variable, though consistent, and more malleable given the circumstances. They should be, in light of climate change, a little bit more forgiving. And I argue that contemporary global movement has already forced a rethinking beyond the nation, traditionally marked by borders and dividing walls, and that the experience of diverse and multiple diaspora make the cosmopolitan framework uniquely relevant to 21st century experiences of land and state for groups and individuals. And in this context, it becomes clear that deterritorialized statehood is not necessarily far-fetched, and in fact, there may already be a rough uh, blueprint of its normative infrastructure in the diverse scholarship of cosmopolitan theory. Um, Post-colonial migration in particular has produced a particular kind of, of citizenship. While citizenship is generally understood to be territorially bound, post-colonial citizenships tend to be deterritorialized and maintained through uh, travel, pilgrimage, labor migration, um, other complex residential patterns that traverse boundaries. And um, territorial boundaries and identity aren't necessarily reflected uh, clearly in the global migration that we're seeing that produces citizens that are actually exercising substantive citizenship in more than one place. In some cases, at least two states, perhaps more. Citizens can enjoy long-distance bonds with nations <coughs> from which they've long immigrated um, and have a strong cultural connection as a result of their shared uh, history. And I offer as an example my own, my own experience largely because if you've ever met a Jamaican, <laughs> you know, um, we have a very strong di diaspora and a strong identity. And in fact, the population of Jamaica is 2.9 million, but two, 2 million to 2.5 million identify as Jamaican and maintain strong relationships in spite of the fact that they are not located in the same place. Um, the, the critical lessons that diasporic communities uh, convey, right? You don't necessarily relinquish substantive citizenship or, or connection or transboundary, transboundary allegiances because you're not in the same place, right? It's viable, therefore, to conceive of a nation that is both dispersed and deterritorialized based on the strong example of diaspora. And even in the Pacific, we are already seeing very strong um, examples of how the migration corridors are producing a strong diaspora in the, um, in the US, as well as in New Zealand and Australia, that the numbers I don't have. Um, this is actually, I, I apologize for the, the date of the census. I was actually up looking to see if there was an update uh, a couple of days ago, and the government shut down did not allow me to, <laughs> to check for the, the census numbers. But let's just take these numbers. And I, I know, for example, that the numbers of Marshallese in our country has increased. And we're seeing that there's a pretty uh, significant uh, diasporic um, uh, set of communities that are expanding throughout the US and certainly in the Pacific region.
Again, the um, comparison is not complete. Uh, again, for members of the diaspora, the existence of multiple, a tangible home remains, and that's significant. You can visit home. Pacific Islanders in particular, uh, generally speaking, have a, a strong relationship to land and territory. Right? It's a, a critical to their identity. In Marshallese language, for example, the word for land and placenta is the same. Right? So it is a, a very stark and, and, and a very um, dramatic uh, event to have to consider losing your territory and being dispersed in this way. But it seems to me that there are some possibilities for understanding the, these transboundary loyalties to allow for all of the rights of citizenship and statehood to um, be afforded to you, even, even to territorialized. Then I argue in the, in the article that if the above is not persuasive, I offer the following. The first is that the presumption in international law uh, is that uh, states continue, right? The continuity of, of, a, of an existing state is, is presumed, and that presumption would be logically extended to current endangered nations. Um, and then also the appropriate interpretation of existing laws and the spirit in which they were drafted and ratified militate in favor of expansive interpretation for the benefit of the people of these endangered states. Um, for example, if we think back to the Peace of Westphalia, right, it was ostensibly uh, introduced to provide security and stability during warring time, right? And that stability and security was represented by borders and nation states. And so allowing a deterritorialized statehood bound by culture and experience uh, would perhaps serve the objective pur purpose of Westphalian system at a time when climate change really introduces an extraordinary threat to territorial integrity and to global peace and security. So I'm going to quickly s s sort of map the C2 nation and say a little bit more about what I think are some really indispensable elements of it, right, the key features of it. Um, First, I argue that to respect the continued sovereign equality of the endangered state, the United Nations and member states must act only to support the transition to an establishment of XC2 nationhood. Again, the trusteeship system is one that has been offered as a possible model. But the UN, and it's something the United Nations has done before and perhaps can be applied in this context. Um, there are important amendments, though, that would have to be made, especially because if we're to recognize the sovereignty of these countries continue, uh, on forward, we'd have to be careful that the role of the international community is purely to support their existence and perhaps <coughs> collaboration rather than to govern those, uh, those countries or the, the XC2 nations. The other piece is that appointed members of the endangered states supported by the UN would serve as a political trustee. So this really would be about uh, governance over time by the uh, Marshallese, for example, right? There would be an establishment of an interim mission, mission and then uh, the permanent nation XC2 status. So the interim mission would then merge with a permanent Republic of Marshall Islands XC2 and continue the, the work of the, uh, the government as it deals with transition. And this is everything from distributing resource rents to adaptation funding to uh, allowing for uh, diplomatic relations and um, resettlement to be negotiated with some sort of government <laughs> entity that would continue to exist. And then this piece I think is really important, it's member driven, and that it, all of the, uh, the meetings, the decision making would be about the uh, furtherance of the, the specific peoples and cultures that are now deterritorialized. Deter and that might even mean that the, the members would decide to dissolve, but that's their decision alone. And that seems to me a key element of any proposal for deterritorialized statehood. I think there are a number of intangible benefits. Uh, formal membership can be passed down through generations. Even without a physical location, the sense of bonded com community will continue to have multi-generational relevance and strength. There's also a possibility that the nationals of the XC2 state can continue to enjoy a shared purpose. Indeed, this seems to be the most powerful binding force of the sovereign order of Malta, whose members remain bonded by history, spirituality, and service. And then there's a possibility for reunion in other locations, right? Uh, common cultural identity might persist. And in, some, in many cases, this is one of the largest fears of Pacific Islanders is that their culture and their identity will uh, vanish along with their territory. So in conclusion, uh, I just want to offer a, a quick uh, story about how uh, some of the ways I've come to think about this. And 
One is that I was at an OCEANS conference with a, a number of climate scientists and we were trying to talk about a divide between scientists and policy members, how we can talk about climate change more effectively and what to do. And one of the scientists actually said the most effective way to communicate about climate change is not the science that I just offered, but to talk about uh, how it links to our kids and our pets and our houses and our jobs, right? And uh, immediately this image of my daughter came up. It was, uh, she, this is her in, uh, in Waikiki, which is a wetland, by the way, um, and might be again very soon. And her, she's so joyful, um, and her feet is you know, covered in water, and it really struck me. As a student of post-colonial theory, a daughter of a colonial subject, an immigrant from a, a former British colony, I've always hoped for a rethinking of the Westphalian order. Um, I've always thought about a progressive redrawing of the world's maps and thinking through borders and boundaries in a way that they would be questioned fundamentally. And now that may well come to pass, but in profoundly different circumstances than I had ever imagined. And now I find myself in the opposite position of searching for ways to save these borders, to uh, save imagined communities for uh, our, our children's generation. Optimally, there would be aggressive action for mitigation, and we wouldn't have to even have this conversation. Many of the islanders would not le need to leave where they live right now. But uh, absent any indication of switch swift action on that front, um, international law, I think, must find suitable solutions for the nation-state problem, the statelessness problem, and related issues. And I offer the nation XC2 as a point of departure. Thank you. Thank you.